I'll wait a while and see if we get the sound back. Okay, so let's see, we'll start over again. Seems like people are hearing me now, perfect. So I'll sort of roll from the beginning again. Thank you everyone who's listening to this session uh, or watching this session. Um, the first EuroVA session on visual analytics methods and applications. Um, so in this session, the presentations are videos that are pre-recorded, so there will be no live presentations. Uh, but you will have a chance of asking questions either through comments in the YouTube chat or through the Discord channel. Uh, and then I'll ask them on your behalf after, uh, after the video presentation and have a, have a conversation with the presenter, uh, which you will see. Um, if you see a question made by someone on, on Discord that you think this is a really good question, I really want to know the answer to this, then do a like on it. And the more likes there are, the more I know this is something people are interested in. So I'll try to keep track on that. Uh, so we have five very interesting papers in this uh, session, uh, covering a wide range of areas from visualization of movement, uh, visual analysis of class separation and set-based data, and also two papers on uh, visual analysis of dynamic networks. And the first presentation is uh, by Yuri Buchmuller, and the paper is called Spatial Rugs, Enhancing Spatial Awareness of Movement in Dense Pixel Visualization. Hello and welcome to our talk on spatial rugs, where we enhance spatial awareness of movement in dense pixel visualizations. My name is Yuri Buchmüller, and on behalf of my co-authors, I'm very happy to have the honor to present our technique to you today. Let's jump right in. Okay, first I want to talk a little bit about the issues that we're facing when trying to design visualization techniques for spatial temporal data, or in other words, movement data. The first thing we have to do is to consider the properties of the data, um, which the most important one is a uh, space where we often uh, face two, sometimes even three dimensions, which are really connected and cannot be taken uh, separately easily. Also, we have a temporal dimension, and um, depending on the amount of movers, we can decide how our, we design our technique and how much detail we can show. Prominent examples here are, for example, streamlines. Um, where we can see where the movers are coming from, where they're going. Maybe we can use even color to encode a feature. But here we have the problem of overplotting, as you can see here, um, very quickly. So it doesn't really scale well to large amount of movers. Second example, we can also use small multiples where we take an excerpt, um, fixed excerpt at different moments in time um, uh, to see the development and to see exactly what's going on. But uh, as well, this uh, doesn't really scale to many movers and also to longer periods of time. Another important property cons to consider when designing visualizations for uh, many movers is also the mover behavior. And we can sometimes even exploit that if it's very uh, uh, similar. We could do something like Tominsky did in 2012 with this very great technique on uh, trajectory stacking. This works well if the trajectories are very similar, but if they're not really similar, um, then we have a problem and then also space-time cube-like visualizations uh, face grave issues. So to combine all requirements and properties of uh, large movement data with many movers with different or changing behaviors into a single and intuitive view is really challenging. To overcome these issues we could for example use dense pixel displays and visual summaries. The advantage of these techniques is that um, they uh, present the information in a very dense way where one pixel is actually one data point and they're static so there's no animation, no jumping back and forth. An example of uh, um, dense pixel displays for movement is the motion rex uh, technique uh, published by us last year. And here you see an example of 151 fish moving collectively uh, over the course of 90 seconds. We have time oriented along the x-axis and a linearized version of space along the y-axis. A rack consists of many slices which contain all movers for each time frame. One of these slices, as seen here, represents one frame in the data and one pixel represents one mover. 
the color of each mover is encoded with a certain feature. So in this case, for example, it's the speed of the fish that are moving here. The vertical order of pixels is a linearization trying to retain the spatial relations between the movers. It is a 1D order, as you can see here, and it is derived by taking the movers positions in one frame and apply spatial linearization techniques, such as, for example, the Hilbert curve. The resulting order is then the vertical order of entities in a slice. Finally, we can color each pixel in a slice according to a feature, and we can repeat the process for all frames, which in the end creates such a motion rug. While in this kind of motion rug we see very interesting things like trends and spatial dynamics in a very static and dense way without the need for animation and stuff like that, we also have a lot of disadvantages. So the foremost is that space is not represented accurately due to the kind of linearization that we are applying. And as well, viewers are really unable to comprehend exactly where and how movements happen. We try to solve these issues by reintroducing spatial dimensions to dense pixel displays using 2D color maps. Um, how does that work? So here's an example. We have our 2D space and about seven movers in it. And here we have our 1D linearization, uh, where we also have some kind of order for our movers. And the question is now, how do we bring space into this 1D linearization? Our idea to do that is to apply a 2D color map and then transform it uh, to the area that our movers occupy, and then just basically take the colors beneath the uh, movers to encode their spatial locations within the 1D linearization. So the big question was basically, which color map can we use to encode our spatial relations? And during our research, we found that most color spaces are not really symmetrical, but our movement areas are, they're rectangular. So we basically need to use 2D rectangular color maps. Now, color perception is very individual to everyone, and it's really hard to find a color map which works well for everyone. Um, and we could have done a lot of studies, but fortunately, someone else did. Um, and this was a paper by Bernard et al. from 2015, which I really recommend. It's a great survey um, and assessment of static 2D color maps. And they tested a lot of different properties, but we, for our purpose, picked the three most important ones, where the first one is the distinguishability of the different colors. The more colors we can different, uh, differentiate, um, the more locations we can encode naturally. So the second um, requirement for our technique is the mental ability of the user to map colors to location. And the third requirement is that the user should also be able to uh, compare different locations that he's seeing. So based on these requirements and the assessment of Bernard et al, we created a pre-selection of color maps which come into question for our purposes. Um, we applied uh, these color maps to uh, the data that I have shown you before, and here we see a few results. And interestingly, we can already see that here, the lower ones um, feature colors which are not as well distinguishable as the ones um, above. And there's a lot more reasoning going on that you can read in the paper for time purposes. I will spare that now. But we found that the best color map for our purposes was the one provided by Ziegler et al., which is the uh, first one here. And the interesting thing here is that not only are the colors very well distinguishable, but also the colors are manually basically anchored in the corners of um, the color map, creating basically uh, four different main color zones. And this responds very well to our idea of having four cardinal direction in a spatial uh, relation. And so we found, um, at least for the time being, that this color map really um, performs well for our task. Well, you might ask, where is the benefit of this visual representation, which only shows spatial development? Besides that it's static, we envision its usage in conjunction with other dense pixel displays, which are stacked and time aligned, showing different features. In other words, the spatial coloring can be treated as just another feature amongst many more, for example, here at the speed. And then these features can be put into the context, basically. Here, for example, we could see that at 
this point in time, the fish were located in the lower right corner of the blue area, where they were relatively fast, and many were further away from the group center than normally. Still, our technique has a few issues, especially when it comes to reuse the case specific scenarios like in collective behavior. In collective behavior, you always look at uh, the group movement as a whole, either be it um, the individual mover moving within the group or the effect of the group on individual movers. But it's always very group centered, the analysis. And sometimes, um, some visually very salient and misleading artifacts can arise if the primary user's interest is group centers. And here in this example, um, we can see that some of the movers of the group um, are actually already in the blue area where the, where the majority of the users is actually in the green area. And this leads to this um, uh, blue stripe in the lower left, which is visually really, really salient um, and has led many of the users that we've shown this to uh, believe that there are actually two separate groups moving in different areas, uh, which is not the case. Um, and, and this is uh, due to the fact that it's easier to perceive different hues than different shades of a color. So here we are again in this perception area. And so the question was now what to do about that. And this is why we were introducing the time aware color smoothing. The time-aware color smoothing is a kernel-based image smoothing technique. Here you can see uh, the comparison between the original and uh, text smoothed version of the scene that I have shown uh, to you right now. And you can see that the artifacts that I have been showing you in the smoothed version really are pretty much reduced compared to the original. So how does this work? Um, first of all, we iterate through all of the pixels. And if we have a pixel that is to be smooth, um, we apply a smoothing matrix um, where we can parameterize the shape and the size. Um, we take the uh, pixels within the matrix, we order them by color, determine a color median, uh, and then apply this median to um, the pixel that is to be smoothed. The user can change the neighborhood size to reflect how coherent the behavior is. The more coherent between neighbors the behavior is, the more neighbors can be taken into account. The shape of the smoothing kernel allows a trade-off between temporal and spatial neighbor coherence. Finally, the frames ahead parameter can be increased for behavior that stays coherent for longer times and decreased for more erratic behavior. Here we compare different parameterizations and uh, the results uh, of our tax uh, color smoothing. And you can see that in the lower examples, even for parameterizations which look far ahead into the future and take a lot of neighbors into consideration, the structures within the different visual patterns are still staying crisp and intact. The advantages of our tax technique is that uh, tax mitigates the outliers by uh, taking color distance into consideration that it preserves pattern crispness better than the Gaussian blur, and that it is really parametrizable to different use cases of uh, different movement data uh, according to the user's needs. So, in summary, we presented a color-based approach to encode spatial relations in dense pixel displays, and we argued for the appropriate color map choice. We also introduced our time-aware color smoothing as a countermeasure against perceptually prominent outliers in use cases like collective behavior, and if you want to try that out, you are more than welcome to do so because we published our method on this GitHub here. For the future, we know that color perception is really subjective. And so we're not sure yet whether we really have found the optimal color map um, for which we need studies to do um, to find out uh, whether there is even a better one maybe. As well, we think that uh, adaptive color mapping based on the movements and even maybe semantic anchoring, which the user can do according to different areas, like for example, where animals feed or sleep or something, could really help improving our approach. With that being said, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, I would be happy to get in touch. We can't unfortunately meet on a coffee, but maybe we can meet on Twitter. Um, and I want to say thank you for listening. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much for that presentation, the video presentation. It's very interesting. So, um, get some time for some questions. So I'll start with one question I have. Um, so, um, the x-axis ordering of your time maps are quite, um, or the maps are uh, quite obvious in terms of having been time steps, and you do have some approaches for uh, dealing with the with the y-axis uh, ordering as well. But have you looked at anything on how the ordering of these individuals along the y-axis, how that affects the perceivability of patterns, and could there be different options depending on what type of, of movement pa patterns that are of interest? Um, absolutely. Uh, this is something we're actually working on right now. Um, it's a little bit difficult um, because um, if you break this kind of um, uh, uh, ordering, which tries to preserve the, the geometrical space, uh, then you usually get really cluttered um, patterns. We have uh, a publication on that uh, on archive. You can check it there. Um, um, when you look for my name, um, and we hope we have it out in, in this, so um, uh, we, we talk a little bit more about these patterns. So there are um, uh, more pattern uh, um, strategies that, that could help here, but we have not let, uh, looked at the uh, conjunction with the color perception right now. Uh, this is something would, that would be really fascinating to do. Okay, great. Uh, so also just to everyone listening, if you have any questions, just ask them on, on the YouTube comments or in Discord. Um, and while I wait for a few questions to come in, I follow up with another one of my questions. Um, so the data, especially the data in the in the paper, is on animals that are have a, a very collective type of movement. I would expect fishes, fish to be moving in a collective way. Um, could it be useful for other types of movements that are not as collective? And in which way do you think that would be helpful for, for analysis? How your visualization would be helpful for that kind of analysis? So we're testing the data, um, uh, the visualization on different, I have to mute this sound here, sorry. Um, we're testing the, the technique also on other uh, data, um, for example, car traffic data. And um, as, as long as you have some kind of uh, common behavior, which um, happens commonly in, in certain areas, you will see uh, patterns like that. Um, uh, we're also testing that on, on, on different um, clusters moving that you can visually separate them. This is all future work, but I can already say that it, it works quite well. And um, uh, yeah, if, if you have movements that are actually pretty random all over the place, then you will not see any any uh, real patterns here. So from chaotic movements, you won't learn a lot um, with with the color based approach. Um, but as soon as as you have some coherence, then maybe it's also useful to find coherences in um, the data when you don't expect some. I would think um, I'm definitely not knowledgeable in, in animal movements or anything like that, but I would think that it could be quite useful for identifying if there's any, any sort of odd movements, any outlier behavior in, in certain individuals, and it could be quite useful to spot those kind of patterns as well. Absolutely. Uh, so we have a question here from Max Sondag, uh, which is, how badly does time aware color smoothing reduce the spatial coherence in practice? And are they only affecting outliers or are they also blurring the boundaries if there are multiple groups present? Um, very good question. We haven't yet tested it with uh, different clusters. And we have also received the feedback that, um, of course, we are introducing the spatial error if we are doing the color smoothing. And um, this is really heavily dependent on the parameters you set. And we have some intuition about how you should set the parameters. But for uh, the brevity of the paper, we were not able to explore that um, better. And uh, we really should uh, uh, would uh, uh, do that in the, in the future work to really find out to which exact situation and behavior and also group configuration um, uh, our technique uh, uh, is applicable to um, with different parameterizations. This is very important to do. And I think if you don't do that right, your results will be bad. Imagine that. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation. And I do know by my own experience that generating videos that work well are definitely just as time consuming and, and difficult as practicing a, present a live presentation. So thank you for your video and uh, for answering the questions. Um, so, you so moving much. on, thank you. So moving on to the next um, video, the next paper. Uh, the paper is presented by Jürgen Bernard, and uh, the paper is entitled CEPX Visual Analysis of Class Separation Measures. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation of CEPX, which is a visual analysis approach for class separation measures. My name is Jürgen Bernard, and together with Tamara Manns, I'm at UBC. I have done this work together with Marco Hutter and Michael Zedelmeyer from the University of Stuttgart and Matthias Zeppelzauer from the University of St. Pauli. Class separation is an important concept in machine learning and in visual analytics. Class separation measures aim at quantifying how well distributions of classes, clusters or groups in datasets can be separated. We focus on measures that give one value per dataset, which is the causes granularity, allowing for the assessment of measures for hundreds of datasets in one analysis approach. In the example, three scatterplot matrices are showing three 5D datasets with two classes, which are blue and red. These three synthetic datasets differ by the degree of class separation from a total overlap to well separated. Class separation measures have several applications in machine learning. First, they can be used for the selection of good that means discriminatory features. With class separation measures, we can determine how well a feature separates two or more classes. A classifier built upon this concept is, for example, the decision tree. A second application is the estimation of clustering performance. The evaluation of clustering methods is difficult, since usually no ground truth exists. So given two clusterings, it's difficult to say which one is the better one. Cluster quality measures can help us to answer these questions. Finally, we can use cluster or class separability measures to estimate the complexity of a classification problem. Given the class labels for every instance of a dataset, we can estimate how well the data distributions of the classes separate from each other. Separation measures are also used in the visualization community. Here, they help us to spot scatter plots that have interesting clustering patterns. This is specifically interesting if we have high dimensional data. Assume you have only 200 dimensions, then there would be almost 20,000 scatter plots in the scatter plot matrix. This is just too much for a human. But with separation measures, we can filter and rank them to focus on the interesting ones. Of course, we can also use them to evaluate and select between different dimensionality reduction techniques. Many separation measures have been proposed in the past, some based on heuristics, some learned from human perception, and many of them quite useful. There is not a single best measure that fits all purposes best. So, which measure to choose for a given problem? How can different measures be compared, qualitatively but also quantitatively? How do measures behave for hundreds of datasets? And finally, how does dimensionality reduction affect class separation scores? We present ZEPEX, an interactive visual analysis tool for identifying and comparing characteristics of class separation measures. ZEPEX supports the interactive visual analysis of up to 12 class separation measures. Along three tasks, analysts can compare measures for high dimensional data, dimensionality reduced data, and for both. Finally, ZEPEX is capable of comparing outputs of measures for hundreds of datasets at the same time. We have chosen a straightforward proof-of-concept setup in our experiments. We take a five-dimensional synthetic dataset with two classes as a basis and vary the distances between the classes from completely overlapping to completely separated classes in 100 steps. This simple setup allows us to analyze the behavior of class separation measures in an environment that we can easily understand and control and that minimizes the influences of uncontrollable biases and factors. A large set of separation measures has been proposed in the past 
They differ by the characteristics they seek to capture. Some focus on local neighborhoods, others use entropy within class and between class distances or minimum spanning trees. For our experiment, we picked 11 of these measures based on their popularity and diversity. While all of them put out a numeric score, they do that on different scales. In practice, this makes comparing them quite hard, especially if you have more than a few data sets. Our overall goal is to facilitate the comparison between multiple separation measures and multiple data sets. We further break down this goal into three tasks. Comparing multiple measures for multiple multivariate data sets, assessing the consistency between multivariate and two data sets, and comparing the measures for different dimensionality reduction methods. The overall system looks as follows. We provide one interface for each task. Task 1 can be seen on the upper left, task 2 is at the bottom, and task 3 is on the upper right. The design target of task 1 is to provide analysts with an overview to compare the characteristics of up to a dozen separation measures for up to dozens of datasets. Analysts need a means to identify individual characteristics and to compare commonalities and differences across measures. This task is a means to the end of selecting the most applicable measures for a task or removing measures with redundant behavior. The task one interface uses parallel coordinates. There's one axis for each measure, labeled at the top, and one gray polyline for each dataset. This choice means that the active value domain of every measure is normalized in the visual space. Here's how we see 11 measures are made comparable, despite differing considerably in their underlying value domains. Parallel coordinates provide a compact display space. Highlighting datasets close together on one axis lets us see whether their distribution changes on all the other measure axes, even the non-adjacent ones. Horizontal line segments between measure axes show linearly correlated measures, whereas slope segments and cross lines that show changes in rank indicate disagreement and inconsistencies. The 100 datasets used in the usage scenario differ in a linear increase of class separation as it was earlier shown in the dataset animation. We analyze the 11 measures along the axis of the parallel coordinates and identify interesting behaviors. Seven measures assess high separability with high values, like the silhouette measure, hypothesis margin, and done. To ease comparison, we flip the axis of the other measures. The linearity of the control dataset is very well reflected by most measures, including average between. In contrast, Davis Bolin and some other measures show a nonlinear behavior. Most measures perfectly preserve the order of the control dataset, except normalized Hubert. This becomes apparent when we select datasets which do not preserve the order for Hubert. Finally, the value domains of the measure outputs differ considerably. Silhouette is for example bound to 0 and 1, whereas other measures are open in one direction, some with a very high value domain such as kalinsky harabras The Task 2 interface uses slope charts to show ranks within each measure and rank changes between the measures when run on ND versus 2D data. Again, separation measures are the columns. Each dimensionality reduction method is given a row, so we have a grid of measures versus DRs. For each chart, the left axis has the measure outputs for the ND data, and the right axis shows the measure applied to the dimensionally reduced 2D data. The results can be interpreted similarly as with task 1, where slopes and crossings indicate inconsistencies between measure scores for ND and 2D. Slope charts are appropriate since our goal is to emphasize rank changes in contrast to the kind of correlation analysis that is typically enabled by scatter plots. Again, we use the 11 horizontally aligned measures. The result of three dimensionality reductions, including PCA, MDS, and TSNE, and those are aligned vertically. Some interesting findings include for the average between measure, TSNE is inconsistent compared to PCA and MDS as it, as it has larger slopes. The PCA based output shows an anomaly. After a detailed investigation, we found out that in Vika's PCA implementation, the 2D PCA only returns one principal component at some point, when the remaining variance is reporting zero. For Davis, Bolin and Dunn, T's knee has some rank differences and thus is rather inconsistent. 
Again, TSME has more slopes and rank changes than PCA and MDS. Hubert Statistics has an interesting diagonal pattern across all three DRs. The projections seem to compress its value range, but it remains mostly consistent. The Task 3 interface uses vertical strip plots to depict the distributions of every measure in full detail without aggregation. The plots are aligned side by side horizontally, with the DR methods nested within each column as shown by the bottom labels. As with the other views, the datasets are gray lines, normalized in the visual space to facilitate comparison. In this view, selections are highlighted by blue triangles on the left side. We chose strip plots as a good way to show distributions through visual density with a consistent look and feel to our other designs. A user control allows switching to box plots as a variant for an aggregated result representation. For the user scenario, we do use the box plots on top of the strip plots. Some groups of measures with similar output patterns stand out. Average between and hypothesis margin form one group of similar patterns. Average within and ball another one. Also, the distance consistency and AMST class separation share similar output patterns. Focusing on the comparison of dimensionality reduction outputs reveals considerable differences as well. An unexpected finding is how strongly measure outputs differ for different DRs, using average between as an example. T's and E yields average to high separability, all PCA based results achieve medium separability. In contrast, average between SSS MDS results hardly separable. Finally, we select the most separated datasets according to the PCA anomaly by using the rectangle selection in the silhouette measure at the upper right. It can be observed how differently these PCA-specific characteristic is reflected across the 11 measures. Zapex is the first interactive analysis tool to support the visual assessment of class separation measures for high-dimensional data, DR-reduced data in 2D and in both. The latter distinction also resembles the three supported tasks. Currently, up to 12 class separation measures can be analyzed using three or more DR methods across hundreds of datasets. Zepex helps to better understand the interaction between separation measures, datasets, and DR methods, and thus helps the deeper understanding of separation measures. Finally, Zepex eases the informed selection of measures for downstream tasks such as data studies or sensitivity analysis. Open topics and future work ideas are as follows. For one, algorithmic scalability is an issue. We make use of pre-calculation, especially due to the large number of DR results that have to be pre-calculated. Pre-processing of measure output is a different aspect, regarding the inversion of value domains, coping with outliers and normalizations to cope with the special value domains of measures. A VA-driven aspect regards parameters of DRs and DR variants. An interesting variant of the approach may be to put a strong focus on the rank-based comparison of measure outputs. Measure of rank violations may also build the basis for visual guidance towards interesting measures. Closely related is the planned extension of the approach for more complex datasets and the question which observations can be generalized. Finally, dependencies of the measure output on data characteristics form a subject to future work. Okay, thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation, interesting paper. I'm sorry, I just need to turn my YouTube sound off. I got myself very confused there for a while. Um, so very interesting paper. I would definitely look more into your work there myself. It sounds like a very useful tool. Um, so there's a couple of questions. The first one is actually one I had myself that someone else has asked as well. So in the paper you are using, um, for all the, uh, for the data you have, you are, are using two different classes. So how well would it, this work if there were more, more than two classes? I can see that if you have three classes, for instance, there would be different types of, of separation patterns where you might have two classes that overlap and one class that is separated. Uh, so can you elaborate a bit on how this would 
potentially impact? Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Sarah. Um, I think the, the answer is, is manifold. Um, first of all, yes, we did some trials on different data sets as, as um, in advance to getting back to two. Um, I think some measures are conceptualized to assess only two classes, but I think the most measures will actually be able and are actually able to separate the multiple classes. Uh, for example, if you use all this work that has been done in, in cluster quality measures, where it's about compactness and separation, uh, which is a concept which is not limited to two classes, but can also be applied to much more. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, another sort of follow up question there is do you have any thoughts around any visualization or any sort of enhancements of the visualization to help understand if there's different types of, of like classification patterns sort of in terms of the example I gave before, for instance, with um, where, where you have some classes overlapping and some being separated, if there could be some sort of enhancement uh, to help understand that. Um, I must apologize, I did not get everything from the question because I had a lag in between, but I'm guessing. Um, this is something that aligns with the review or comment we also got. Uh, in our paper, we are analyzing 100 data sets in parallel. This is all the gray lines that you have seen. But if you're interested in something that seems to be interesting to you, then it would, of course, make so much sense to focus on this particular data set and then use all the high dimensional visualization data capability that you're having. And then you, of course, can see what actually caused the, the, the effect that you saw in the measures. So we did that a lot of times. Unfortunately, we have no space in the paper to bring up an example, but we um, extended the supplemental materials, um, especially since the reviewers asked us and recommended us to do that. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think that will be the last question for your presentation. Uh, and we move on to the third one. Um, that is a paper called Dual Radial Set. And the presenter in the video is uh, Krasimir Matkovic. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got him with us today, so there will not be any chance to ask questions afterwards. But if you have any uh, questions... I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Okay, so uh, he's here now. Sorry, my fault. There were some problems before. Okay, so then we go on with the video presentation and some questions afterwards. Hello, my name is Kreshmir Matkovic. I'm from VRV's research center in Vienna, and I will present the, our paper, which is called Dual Radial Set. This is a joint work with Dennis Gratian from Virginia Tech, Matea Batum from ABL in Croatia, Rainer Splechner from VRVIS and Helwig Hauser from University of Bergen. Sets, a well-known concept from mathematics. Uh, set is a well-defined collection of distinct objects and we all know for Venn diagrams they were introduced in 1880 but probably they were used uh, much before. We can easily represent one, two, or three sets, as seen on the left here, but if we have four sets, it's not so trivial, because for a Venn diagram, we have to have regions of all possible overlaps. So we have to have it from the first set only, first and second, uh, second only, first and second, and third, third only, all possible combinations. And now if we increase the number of sets from four to five, it becomes more and more uh, clumsy, so to say, and overlapped. And for six sets, it's, it's already very hard to see which area of the, of the diagram corresponds to which cross uh, section of the sets. We will use a, a movie, uh, movie data set in this example. It's just a collection of thousand something movies. And for every movie we can have, for example, um, we, we have like, we can put them in various genres. Here I just put three of them, drama, comedy, and romance. So we can see, for example, that some movies are drama only, like The White Balloon or Nadia. Some of them are comedy only, like The Birdcage. Some of them are comedy and romance, like French Twist. 
and some of them are romance, drama and comedy, like Cinema Paradiso. In this way we can easily see the genres of individual movies. Now, instead of putting the movies in these sets of drama, romance and comedy and their corresponding intersections, we can have another approach. We can say that each movie has a set of genres. So the movie Touch, for example, has a set that contains romance only. City of Angels has a set of genres, again romance only, but Cinema Paradiso has a set of romance, drama and comedy. If we go to French Twist, it has a set of romance and comedy. Angels and Insects have a set of romance and drama. So we can say, not that each movie belongs to a certain set, or to more of them, if this is in an intersection of sets, but that each movie contains a set of genres. And so, we can say each movie has a set type attribute. The set type data is, became popular recently in visualization of visual analytics. So we have in 2014 State of the Art uh, and Future Challenges report uh, at Eurovis. Uh, I listed here just three, three, more, uh, three more papers, there are many more. So there is upset, uh, very also nice uh, visualization of intersecting sets by Alex Lex and others, presented at Infovis 2014. And then two, two similar papers, which are basically basis of our paper, which I present today. This is one is radial sets, presented at uh, VIS 2013 and published in TVCG, and another one presented at VIS 2008. So, let, let's start with the cetogram now. A cetogram is a frequency-based approach, where we can check cardinality of genre sets per movie. So you remember, we have these sets of genres per movie, and now in this histogram-like uh, view, we can see, for example, that drama, that drama is, is the most, uh, the most movies have the drama genre, then the comedy is the second most often, then we have action, thriller, and romance, uh, quite, quite, quite similar number of appearance in our data set. And now you see some subdivisions of these bins, and these subdivisions which show us the cardinality of genre sets. The, the, lowest, the lowest one shows if the movie has only one genre. So you, you will see it now in the next movie. So, so if we go to drama, the lowest one is approximately half of drama movies have drama only. Thriller only is not so often. Adventure only is quite a very, very low number. Action only, you also see a low number. The next one is romance plus one. So if it is plus one or drama plus one, if it is plus one, for example, so if we have drama plus one, we can see that it's most often romance. It's just a slightly less comedy. And then we have a, a lot of various movies which come with drama together. So the radial set, presented 2013, basically uses the same idea on the, on the circle, just arranges it circularly. So you can see these this bars in, in circular sectors, which corresponds to, for example, genre only, genre plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and more. And, of, and they, use, they use the area in the middle to depict additional information. So, but now you can say, okay, but movies, they do have sets of genres, it's clear, but at the same time, they can have a sets of awards. The, the patients can have sets of symptoms, but they can also have a sets of treatments. Fruits and vegetables, they do have sets of colors. Apples can be green and red and yellow, bananas are yellow, oranges are orange. And, do they, and, do, and they do have a set of vitamins that they contain. So some of them have only C, some have C and D, some of them have B and C and D, various combinations. So we have a set of vitamins and set of colors, sets of symptoms and set of treatments, sets of genres and sets of awards. Um, many, many other possibilities are possible. So, of course, we can mer merge those together in one huge 
set attribute that we combine genres and awards in one attribute. But does it really make sense? Is this what we want to see? If we say drama plus one, do we want to see it's basically it's either comedy or maybe it's Oscar? Or should we use maybe two views? And our solution that I will present here today is basically when we have two set type attributes, in our case, in this example, we have awards and genres for movies, and we use single view that we call dual radial set. It's clear why. We have dual, we have two radial, we have two genres, two set type attributes, and we show them in a set type like attribute. We split the circle in two halves, and you can see here on the left we have awards, and on the right we have genres. Now, now we can see separately which, which awards come more alone, which come more in combination. For example, for example, Academy Science Fiction and Fantasy Horror Award comes quite often alone. Academy Awards come more often in addition to one more and so on. So, if we select Romance plus one, we can see this plus one is either drama or comedy. And now we can see which awards do these Romance plus one movies get. So we can see they get Academy Awards, either alone or plus one plus two, Golden Globes, either alone, plus one plus two, and BAFTA Awards, never alone. So, this is something which we could not see from a single view. So if we have romance plus two plus one, this one is either drama or comedy and the awards. It's never buffed alone, but it comes together with the Globe, Golden Globes and Academy Awards, which can also come alone. We introduced also two more extensions to, to, to the radial set, basically to dual radial set, but they can be straightforward applied to the radial set. We introduce here empty set, you see it on the right, quite many, quite many movies do not have awards. And interestingly, this, this empty set concept is sometimes needed, sometimes not. On the left hand side we have genres which are, which are not so often empty, so most of the movies do have genres, so maybe it makes no sense to have empty set for genre, but it makes sense for awards. More than half of movies do not have any award. Second, a second mode that we propose is equal sector size mode, where we show all sectors the same width in order to study in-sector relations, to see better what happens in one sector? Uh, is, this, is this genre or award more often alone, like, like MTV Movie Awards, which is quite dominantly alone, or Academy of Science Fiction, Berlin International Film Festival comes alone, or some others that are combined with others. And, and this is something, or it, the same is true for the genres. So, this dual radial set is fully integrated in a correct multiple view framework. You can brush in any views. We, have, we see here some scatter plots, some histograms, brush, uh, box plots, and everything that is brushed you, you can see in the dual radial set. And of course, you can see the details on demand in the lower part of the table. You have a table with really, with really your, uh, your uh, data. And if you take a look in the table, we have this set type dimensions where we really list the names of the elements of the set divided by a vertical bar. Finally, a future work includes support for more than two set dimensions. It makes it seems straightforward to integrate the third or fourth, just divide circle in more parts, but is it then too crowded? Do we have enough place for 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 every individual set type dimension? There are many, many questions that has to be solved. Or do we need a new view? Uh, do we need a new view maybe even for two sets with more details, with different uh, supporting different analysis tasks? We would also like to evaluate this with new data, with domain experts in different domains. With this perspective of future work, I conclude my talk and I am open for the questions. Thank you.
thank you very much for a very interesting presentation again. Um, so I have one question to start with while we're waiting for others to give their questions on YouTube or Discord. Uh, so could you elaborate a little bit around sort of the benefit of using radial versus using a linear layout? Uh, and also, uh, I was thinking that you could probably sort of unfold the, the circular layout and perhaps adding the dual sets on top of each other if you make it linear. So thinking around if you have any comments around whether that would help in terms of having more than two, um, yes. two sets. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the initial idea of radial set compared to linear or, or linear uh, organization layout is that you can use the place in the middle for additional information. We are not using it now because we didn't have enough place also in these four pages in Eurovia paper and so on. But we do plan to, to use this place in the middle to show additional information. And placing it between the two would make it, uh, we think, more, more related and more, more focused that you can see it in comparison if you use two linear unfolded uh, setogram is called in the original paper views on top of each other or next to each other and then where to place the, the information that is in the middle so to say but you are right but one could apply the same principle with with two two views yeah Okay, thank you. Uh, so would you say that the, the ordering of the, um, the set categories, have that got any impact if you would sort of order them in a different way within the circle? Um, have, you, have you any thoughts around if, if, if it impacts and how it could be addressed? Uh, it's, uh, hard to say. I mean, did not... So... I don't know if you hear me still. I hope so. Uh, uh, yeah, now I do. <laughs> okay, so the the order we did not experiment with the order. So basically, we we, we we take the order as given as given in the in the data set. So the, the first set that is mentioned basically comes first, and we did not experiment with reordering the sets. Okay. And someone asked about number of dimensions. Uh, the attributes. Yeah, there's a question on how far yes. should set visualization go in terms of number of sets and number of set type attributes. Yes, so we have two attributes, but pro attribute, if you have like a dozen of different uh, runs of awards or whatever you have, it, it's okay. But if you have like 20, 30, 100, it is definitely too much. So I would say about a dozen is, is, a, is a quite a limit. And if you go in another direction, we have this, uh, uh, I don't know, genre alone, plus one, plus two, plus three, we can limit this. So we can merge them uh, like five and more in the one in the one bar. So just to, 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 because otherwise they are very, very small ones that they just go up, 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 and you, you have nothing from them. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again for uh, an interesting presentation or an interesting video, I should perhaps say. And with that, we'll move on to the uh, fourth paper in the session. So now we have two papers left, and the last two are both addressing different methods for visual analysis of dynamic networks. And the first one is presented by Hassan Alpos, and the title of the paper is An Exploratory Visual Analytics Tool for Multivariate Dynamic Networks. Welcome. My name is Hassan Alpos, and I'm a first year PhD student studying in Sabah University, Istanbul. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about an exploratory visual analytics tool for multivariate dynamic networks with special attributes. In its simplest form, a network consists of nodes representing entities and edges that capture the relationship between them. In a multivariate network, nodes and edges possess a finite set of attributes. These attributes can be of any data type and they are domain specific as well. In reality, a network may not be static the network topology may vary along the temporal axis, 
in the sense that new nodes and edges may occur while existing ones disappear. Moreover, the set of attributes may alter as well. Multivariate dynamic networks capture such phenomena as chronologically ordered temporal snapshots. Examining the overall structure of the network may yield limited results in a microscopic scope. To this end, ego networks help readers understand the surrounding environment of a particular node. An ego network consists of an ego node with its directly connected neighbors and links connecting them. An exemplar figure can be observed here. In a dynamic network, a particular node's ego network may vary across a temporal axis and thus, in a way, constitutes its own dynamic network. Analyzing the temporal evolution may reveal invaluable insights regarding the ego node and its neighborhood. The developed exploratory tool aims to answer questions from two different perspectives, the overall network and ego networks. In the overall network perspective, the questions are where are the top performing nodes located in the network? Or how do a group of nodes, domain and network attributes look like? And in the ego network perspective, the primary goal is to display the temporal evolution of the selected node. And lastly, detecting the similarities and drifts between the temporal ego networks. Next, I'm going to talk about the proposed exploratory tool. Here, the figure displays the developed tool with its components. Each component in the tool serves towards a particular objective. Network overview component serves as the main component of the tool. A temple snapshot of the network is displayed as a node link layout. A temple snapshot of the network allows the users to focus on the dynamics of the current time step. Users are able to set a different temporal snapshots of the network with the help of visual encoding and filtering component, which also enables users to encode domain-specific attributes with visual elements such as color, shape, and size. Spatial encoding component allows users to observe the mapping between the network topology and the corresponding locations on the map. In addition, domain-specific attributes are encoded with the same set of visual elements. In order to display the distribution of domain and network attributes, a swarm plot based component is deployed. Here, the users are able to perform click and brush operations to observe the attribute distribution of selected nodes. In order to display the temporal increases and decreases in both domain and network attributes, a pixel display is utilized. The direction of change is encoded with colors in each time step as small rectangular glyphs. Each row in the table corresponds to a node in the network with its domain and topological attributes displayed in the columns. The users are able to directly perceive the change between consecutive time steps. Moreover, they can still obtain the row value with a hover action. In the ego network component, a timeline-based view is deployed so that the users are able to observe the difference between ego networks from consecutive time steps. Here, the same set of visual elements are utilized to encode the domain-specific attributes. However, timeline-based views are limited in terms of their ability to convey the temporal evolution. To this end, the ego network component incorporates two different views for the users. A spatial layout-based view is deployed. For a given time step, an ego network is represented with its feature vectors, consisting of values from its domain and network-specific attributes. Once the feature vectors are extracted, the resulting vectors are projected onto a 2D view, so that the proximity between the entities capture the similarities between them. Here, multidimensional scaling with Canberra distance is employed. In addition, color encoding is utilized to display the individual time steps. Next, I'm going to talk about the use case scenario on merchant networks. This is actually another research project conducted in our lab with researchers from MIT Media Lab and Megagon Labs. The project proposed to incorporate network-related features into well-being prediction 
of small and medium-sized enterprises, and hence the name Merchant Networks. In addition to the conventional financial attributes, the well-being of a merchant is modeled with respect to its ego network attributes as well. In order to create an edge between two merchants, the number of shared customers should exceed a threshold value. With the help of the resulting ego networks, the research team aims to obtain a better prediction result. The credit card transaction data was provided by a private bank operating in Turkey. Transactions are made by registered customers in registered merchant venues between July 2014 and June 2015. The officials of the bank anonymized required fields such as customer and merchant identification values. Moreover, in the Ego Network Special Layout View, domain-specific attributes are incorporated into feature vectors. These attributes are revenue, average transaction amount, number of transactions, and number of customers, which are also the features deployed in the predictive model. Merchants are colored with respect to two different schemas. Merchant categories such as supermarkets and insurance companies and also the detected communities clusters in the network. Shape encoding is deployed to represent successful and failing merchants, where diamonds represent successful ones. This metric corresponds to the well-being that is defined by the research team. Here, a group of successful merchants are selected with brushing. And the corresponding temporal domain and network attributes are displayed below. In addition, users are able to observe the location of these attributes with respect to the other merchants. Upon brushing the attribute distribution view, Users are able to observe where the top performing merchants are located on the network. Here, the top performing merchants in the closeness centrality measurement are selected and the corresponding merchants are highlighted on scattered views. If we click on one of the successful merchants in the network, its eco network is displayed as a timeline below. To switch to the special layout view, users click on the button at top left corner. Here, the proximity between the time steps show that in April, the ego network drastically drifted. With this clue, users can invest more time in April and investigate the situation. To conclude, in this study, we developed an exploratory visual analytics tool for multivariate dynamic networks and displayed it with a real-world dataset, Merchant Networks. We would like to evaluate the tool with a larger network and conduct a case study that involves detailed questionnaires to evaluate the tool. Thank you for listening. I wish help to you and your families. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. <clears throat> so, um, following up with a couple of questions for this one as well, um, as I understand, the data set that you have in the presentation in the paper is it has a fairly small number of time steps. And could you elaborate a little bit on the scalability of the method, particularly in terms of temporal scalability, and if there is some some limit? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, this is actually one of the aspects that we are working on. So hopefully we are going to be incorporating a much more uh, greater uh, data into our tool so that uh, we can observe the response from our tool. So this is one of the things that we are working on actually. Okay, great. So um, thinking about the ego networks, if I understand it correctly, when you have the different time steps with different ego networks for each time step, there is a new layout for each each of the, the ego networks. So a node may move between one time step to another. Is that correctly understood? So in, in, in ego, ego network, uh, the nodes may appear and then disappear uh, between consecutive time steps 
because their edges, the connections between them may dissolve or occur in another time step. So uh, different uh, nodes, so in our use case, merchants may occur in the uh, further time steps as well. Yeah. So is there any way of um, to help the user sort of trace between the different time steps if something is occurring or disappearing and occurring again? Is there some, some sort of aid to analyze across time steps? So thank you for the uh, comments. Uh, this might be actually a very good, uh, a very good, let's say, uh, functionality that we may think of to add to our tool. But currently there is no such aid. Okay, thank you very much. Then I think it's time to move on to the last presentation in this session. And uh, that is a paper uh, presented by Vung Pham um, with um, a paper titled Dual Net View, Dual Views for Visualizing the Dynamics of Networks. Dual net view, dual views for visualizing dynamics of networks by Bung Pham, Manuel, and Antomida from Interactive Data Visualization Lab, Competition Department, Texas State University. Motivation of this work is that the force directed LIDAR is a popular visual method for revealing network structures such as clusters and important vertices. However, it is not capable of representing temporal patterns such as how clusters or community evolves. Therefore, the dynamic visualization trade the overall structures for temporal relationships. In this paper, we present a dual view framework for capturing both overall structures and temporal patterns within the networks. The link supplementary views utilize the strengths of both visualization techniques to provide useful insight into the given networks. Dual view visualization and interactions. The first component of this dual net view is the force directed node link networks on the left. This one helps to provide overall structures of the network. Nodes are the circuits designating participating computers in this case. Node size indicates numbers of interaction involving um, within it. The colors of the nodes indicate its type, such as inside, unknown, or outside for this case. On the other hand, links represent the communication among nodes. Link colors represent its communication type, like permitted, MVL, or none in this case. The loopback link means the source and the target are the same. The force directed layouts help to bring nodes with more communication together which help to form clusters and also uh, help to bring the most important um, nodes into the center. The second part of this dual net view is a force directed dynamic networks. It's help to provide temporal patterns of the network over time. The horizontal lines represent participating nodes. Colors indicate they are types just like previously described. Thickness represents the group of nodes, let's say. For this, it contains a, a group of nodes with similar communication patterns. The overall hated X represent communications among nodes. Color encodes communication types, as described previously as well. Thickness designates the number of communication at a time. Force directed layout, because of the time constraint, this force directed layout is used to bring the nodes with related nodes together in the vertical orientations. This one is also helped to um, detect communities as well. Interactions. Several of the interactions are provided to dig down into details of any lesser events of concerns. Let's say users can mouse over a node to view its information and its related records at the tables at the button. Users can also click on the link to view all the communication within that link display on the this table as well. Users can also mouse over any nodes on the horizontal lines here to view its related interaction over time. Use cases. Rural net views use cases. A natural application of network analysis is for analyzing computer network. 
Therefore, we apply a solution to investigate one-day network threat load from a sub-network of an organization. This one-day snapshot contains 3,448 network communications among 157 unique devices inside a sub-network. One IP is from our side, and others are unknown sources. It is observable from this network networks that there are four clusters among the devices, cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, and cluster 4, and two suspicious addresses, as from outsider and unknown sources. Two clusters, cluster 1 and cluster 2, was being attacked by an outsider and also unknown sources. On the other hand, cluster 3 and cluster 4 was only attacked by the unknown sources only, and they also have lookback. It is feasible that from 3 p.m., the outside network attacked the network massively. This attack would assume to be scanning process that the suspicious attackers were using to look for vulnerable devices inside the network. After this massive scanning from about 6 p.m. onward, unknown sources periodically communicated with a group of computers inside the network. All in all, this use case demonstrates the utility of door view approach. One has to give an overview and indicate suspicious events and cluster why the others examining the temporal patterns. This timeline view is useful to discover temporal pattern. However, it's still kind of hard to try and follow the paths. For example, it is not trivial to visually discern the degree of separation between the outsider and the unknown source. And they are very clear and evidently separated in the Nodlink force directed layer. We also applied dual net view approach to analyzing a malware. Specifically, in this case, we use network analysis for the separate XA malware. The blue eggs are process creations, the loop eggs are SAP calls. The network over here depict that separate XA in this red circle is a very busy node and it is brought to the center. This so helps to narrow down about the item for us to inspect later on. In dynamic networks, it depicts server accept behavior over time. For instance, at this time, it's called to cmd.exe and cmd.exe in turn called to several of other processes like ping, task kill, and cornhost.exe as well. All in all, the dual approach view helps to analyze this malware very well. Note link network helps us to investigate related nodes, and on the other hand, the dynamic network helps us to discover attack patterns of the malware. In this third use case, we outline the net view to analyze social network. This social network includes all the activities from 20 casus employees. Those employees are filters by suspicious people. The around headed acts represent types of communication among them. The node link network depicts the overall communication structure within this group created over time. On the other hand, the dynamic network represents the communication pattern over time. It's interesting that from this box A, Christine and Rosalia made server of the phone call communication before Rosalia made the suspicious purchase with Janice at this time. And then after that, they made a series of other phone calls to communicate about this suspicious event. This use case is also used to depict the helpfulness of combination of the two views, the node link diagram with aggregation of communication over time and also the temporal pattern to detect the suspicious event. Implementation, source code and what prototype of this approach is given in this long address. Conclusion, the net view approach provides a not link network to keep the overall structure of the network aggregated over time. The dynamic network focuses on the temporal details. Interactions help to drill down into events of concerns. Also, this will provide several use cases of using the net view in analyzing company networks, malware, and also analyzing social networks. In the future, we'll investigate the scalability of the system or we'll recommend suitable operations such as uh, adaptive aggregation and uh, furthermore, we'll also have navigating and exploring large dynamic networks at different levels of granularity.
Thank you. And if you have any questions, you can address now or please contact us at um, footpath at ttu.edu or Nguyen or to me that with um, email comments will be here. And these are the references to the um, use cases that we listed above. Okay, thank you again for a very interesting presentation. Uh, so I have a question here around scalability. Obviously, sure. at some point, scalability will be an issue. Uh, and you mentioned in the paper that you provide a range of interactions, such as filtering and brushing, to support dealing with, uh, with the scalability and the size of the network. So I'm wondering if you are using or if you're considering using any type of visual guidance um, to help a user to understand um, and identify which part of the network that might be potentially interesting and what potentially interesting interaction patterns there are in the networks. Yes. So uh, regarding regarding the uh, guide, there we do provide interaction that we can mouse over some of the um, suspicious notes on the left panel which is a note there, or we can always mouse over the uh, suspicious notes on the um, right panels as well to focus on the interaction related to that uh, specific notes only. And regarding the scalability of expanding to more, uh, the bigger size of the network, actually we have done some of them, which is like we group a set of notes or interaction with similar um, interaction, let's say they do the same interaction at the same time, then we're going to group them in, in, in order to reduce the number of nodes. And also we actually explore uh, the way of adding um, web worker in there so we can do parallel processing so that we can extend to larger number of nodes as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so a quite different kind of questions. Uh, during the design of this, have you had any, any users involved in the design process or have you got any feedback from potential users thinking that networks as a visualization can be a bit complex to understand if you're not used to them? So, Yes, yes, that's true. Actually, we work with some of the uh, uh, network and administrators in the organization in the organization that we mentioned over there, then yeah, at first it's, it's take them some time to understand what's going on. But actually yeah, after understanding the notions of the, the, the um, program, they explain that it can show the pattern pretty well. So it is useful. Okay, yeah, it's good to hear, yes. very interesting. Uh, okay, so I'll finish with the questions there. And thank you thank again you. for an interesting video presentation. Thank you. And with this, I would like to uh, end this session by first of all thanking all the presenters for very interesting, interesting papers and interesting video presentations and very interesting answers to questions as well. Uh, not least, I also would like to thank the technicians that have helped us sort all these technical issues out and, and dealing with the technical problems that may occur. So thank you very much to, to technicians, organizers and presenters. And thank you to everyone who has been listening to this uh, session. Uh, so thank you very much.